Oh God, take our minds and think through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Poor Nicodemus. He is so conflicted and confused. Nicodemus is a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin and should be an expert on all the things of God. He comes to Jesus in the dark of the night because he recognizes that Jesus must be, as he says, a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. But he is dumbfounded by Jesus' response to him, which is that no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. The word used here can be translated either as again or from above. The New Revised Standard Edition translates it as from above, but it is also the source of the expression, you must be born again. Clearly, Nicodemus takes this literally. Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born again? Jesus uses this opportunity to teach Nicodemus that this second birth is of water and the spirit. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Jesus describes the action of the spirit with the metaphor of the wind using a word that means both wind and spirit. This new birth in the spirit is described in the fifth century by St. Cyril of Alexandria this way. Our Lord Jesus Christ called the new birth through the spirit from above, showing that the spirit is of the essence above all essences through whom we become partakers of the divine nature. Through him and in him, we are reformed to the archetype of beauty, reborn into newness of life, and remolded to the divine sonship. But Nicodemus did not understand this, so the Savior answered gently, except a man be born again of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. For since man is not simple in his nature, but is composed of body and soul, he requires a twofold healing for his new birth. By the spirit, the human spirit is sanctified. By the sanctified water, the body. From the beginning, the church has recognized the water to be the water of baptism, and the spirit to be the Holy Spirit so that the new birth consists of being joined to Christ in the water of baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit through anointing or chrismation. Jesus gave us the way to enter God's eternal kingdom, and by following his way, we become God's children through adoption. There is a saying going around the internet that makes me laugh. It goes, if you haven't grown up by age 50, you don't have to. But really, who would want their children, however much we love them, to remain immature for their whole lives? The greatest joy of being a parent is to see a child grow and become more capable, more creative, more loving, and more able to enjoy and share the good gifts that we have given them. I believe God is like that. In fact, I know that God is like that. Jesus tells us that God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that God gave us his only Son because he so loved the world. Everyone who believes in his Son may be saved to have eternal life. St. Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans that salvation is God's gift to us and that for one who trusts God, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. However, 
as the Oxford Study Bible reminds us, salvation is more than mere mental acceptance of Christ and his teachings. Christ is our model for action, our big brother, and we must not remain infants, but follow him with the help of the Holy Spirit into a spiritual maturity. How shall we do this? Well, we have some very helpful instructions from Jesus about how to grow toward being the children of God that we were created to be. Above all, we are to love God and we are to love our neighbor. I like Fred Rogers' definition of the word love. Love isn't a state of perfect caring. It is an active noun, like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and now. In our baptismal covenant, we also promise to continue in the apostles' fellowship and teaching, in the prayers and in the breaking of bread. We promise to persevere in resisting evil and whenever we fall into sin, to repent and return to the Lord. This requires us to examine our consciences and acknowledge our sins. This season of Lent we have an opportunity to participate in the beautiful sacrament of reconciliation of a penitent. We are blessed to have this opportunity. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It is a freeing and a blessed practice. It is part of growing up to truly look at our faults, to name them specifically, to feel remorse, and to plan our amendment of life. If you have been a parent, you will know how proud you are of a child who admits that they have done wrong and plans how to do better. This season of Lent, we can grow in spiritual maturity by confessing our sins and receiving God's forgiveness. We can also grow spiritually this Lent by the lovely practice of spending daily time in prayer, resting in the loving presence of God. Theologian Henry Nowen writes beautifully about one way to do this. This quotation is a bit long but it is very worth our while to hear how he recommends prayer in a letter to a young friend. He says, listen to your heart. It's there that Jesus speaks most intimately to you. Praying is first and foremost listening to Jesus who dwells in the very depths of your heart. He doesn't shout. He doesn't thrust himself upon you. His voice is an unassuming voice, very nearly a whisper, the voice of a gentle love. Whatever you do with your life, go on listening to the voice of Jesus in your heart. This listening must be an active and very attentive listening. For in our restless and noisy world, God's so loving voice is easily drowned out. You need to set aside some time every day for this active listening to God, if for only 10 minutes. 10 minutes each day for Jesus alone can bring about a radical change in your life. In our baptismal covenant, there are many challenges to proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, to strive for justice and peace among all people, and to respect, respect the dignity of every human being. It's a tall order. We have a long, long way to grow up into the people God has created us to be. How grateful we are that God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn us, 
but that he so loved us that he gave us his only son that we might share in his glorious kingdom as his mature and beloved children. Amen. <laughs>